The real estate industry is the world's single largest contributor to climate change. At Fifth Wall, we're on a mission to help the industry eradicate its carbon emissions and build to zero. Stefan, thank you so much for joining. Where are you coming in from today? Yeah, Brendan, thanks uh, very much. Um, I'm currently in New York. Oh, nice. We, we must be neighbors. I'm in New York, too. Can you start maybe by just giving people your background and, and kind of the arc of your career as an architect and specifically, you know, your interest and your focus in sustainable design? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm actually originally from the Netherlands. Um, I went to uh, architecture school in Delft. And there were two events that really changed my trajectory. The first is uh, I worked in a very small team on what was then the competition for the world's tallest tower, the Canton Tower in Guangzhou, the south, the south of China. Uh, and we ended up winning that competition to our own surprise and, and building the tower. But it kind of expanded my interest from just kind of, you know, individual buildings to more larger scale projects and, and larger scale infrastructure. And then the second event was, uh, I actually studied abroad in Barcelona. So for, for those of you know you who've been there, it, for me, it was just an eye opener of you know what cities can do to reinvent themselves. So Barcelona up until Franco who was the, the nationalist dictator, uh, was not a very pleasant city. It was very kind of industrialized. And then you know, after he left, architects, they had schemed for years to upgrade the city, being there and seeing how people kind of enjoy the public space, how people take, you know, the public transit, which was really good, uh, and how people just, you know, enjoy life there and how it became really a, a magnet for tourists as well. This made me aware of kind of the power of urban design. So with that, I decided to do a PhD in city planning at UC Berkeley. Around that time, the word kind of sustainability became more, more dominant in a lot of the, the research I was reading and city planning departments, architects, they started to take this up. I'm a, I'm a professor, I'm also an author, I published several books. But in, in addition to that, I, I still practice on kind of projects that are really focusing on ur urban design and sustainability. Got it. As, you know, an academic, yeah. how do you define sustainable building design and how do you view that as kind of separate and discrete from sustainable city design? So when it comes to buildings, I mean, most of the carbon, if, if we're talking about uh, reducing carbon in, in terms of uh, su sustainability, but in terms of carbon, the, I would say the two big buckets, and I'm sure you're aware of them, is is kind of the operational carbon. So in the United States, the biggest part of that is cooling, actually, and, and it overtook heating uh, because of you know uh, temperature rising. So heating, cooling, uh, lighting uh, in big buildings, elevators, right? But I think the real skeleton in the closet, something that we haven't really focused on, is the embodied carbon. So all the energy that is, sits in in the buildings, uh, and I think that is a you know, a question of materials, you know, life cycle. And, and that is a much harder question, I think, to solve for us right now. And, and there's virtually no regulation uh, about that. It's changing, though. Um, I think many cities around the world are thinking about that, particularly the EU. They have this kind of circular economy framework that now some cities are implementing, like London and Paris. They're going to mandate life cycle assessments before projects. And can I ask, is that for new construction? Because one of the questions I obviously have is, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're both in New York and obviously a city like yeah. London as well, you're dealing with a yeah. lot of pre-war buildings and buildings yeah. are yeah. liquid assets. They trade hands. So yeah. I imagine that the, the variance in terms of embodied carbon probably between buildings, the building I'm sitting in right now, the person ultimately responsible for building such yeah. a high embodied carbon asset it is no yeah. longer accountable. So how do yeah. you deal with that from a regulatory perspective? So yeah, I think that's a good point. I think right now, there are all the sample projects I've seen that really focus on kind of new construction. So design for deconstruction, I, I don't know if you, you see, or design for disassembly, a really interesting trend. And there's a couple what of pavilion projects. What pro is that? Can you, can you explain that for people? Yeah, it's, it's, it's designing a building with the end of life in mind. Meaning, you know, normally it's a very linear process, right? We have our relationship of our suppliers, they bring up, you know, uh, construction materials on, on the job site, it, it, it's being put together. And then 50 years down the line, all of this is demolished. But what if instead of kind of waste at the end of life of a building that becomes kind of a resource? So there's, there's various pilot projects that have been commissioned to 
kind of change that and make it more circular. So just to name a couple of initiatives, uh, one is like buyback schemes, right? In which suppliers, they provide you with the material, but then they offer to buy it back at the end of the building's life. But that means that has a lot of consequences, right? When when suppliers do that, that means that, you know, first of all, the material needs to be in a good state. So you can't just have, uh, let's say, a steel beam welded to another steel beam, or you can't just have a, a wood beam that's drilled through, right? So it's, it's very different different types of connections that would need to be created for this reuse of materials. The other piece is that there needs to be some material database that kind of scans. So, so you have a QR code on each material so you can scan it. And afterwards, 50 years down the line, people know exactly, oh, uh, this is this uh, material from this supplier. Let's sell it back to them or, or sell it to some other vendor that may be interested in this. It's interesting. So effectively, the, you know, the component parts of a building need to be modularized in, you know, as, as reusable a fashion as possible. Mm -hmm. And you structure these kind of forward buyback rights. But one of the questions that, that kind of begs for me is like, well, what if the suppliers aren't around? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's a good question, right? So there's lots of risk there. And yeah, they haven't really worked it up work this out yet. I've only seen this being implemented at temporary kind of demonstration projects. So they create pavilions that are up for a couple of weeks and then they decommission them. So yeah, I mean, it, it still needs to be uh, for, for this to really kind of scale up to the actual real estate industry. I think there's lots of hurdles to overcome. The other thing that we're seeing across cities is how kind of some governments, so for instance, the Netherlands, where I'm from, they're commissioning kind of databases in which they're going to create inventories of all existing buildings and see what materials are there. And then they match them up with new construction. I think the embodied carbon question is really uh, much harder. And the expectation is by 2050. So right now, if you look at the proportion of operational carbon versus embodied carbon, I would say it's about two and a half times more operational carbon, right? But because the efficiency of our buildings is improving because our, our energy system is becoming more renewable, uh, we're expecting that by 2050, uh, it will be one-to-one -one ratio, operational versus embodied carbon. So, so I think you know, the market will generally move towards embodied carbon more and more uh, because it's, the opportunity is getting larger. And, you know, when you think about, obviously, embodied carbon, new building materials are hold mm -hmm. a lot of promise, obviously, in, in yeah. paying real estate owners to efficiently, you know, comply with the, these new standards. Which of those materials kind of excites you the most? So I've worked with several of them, and, and probably the one that most of the industry is excited about is mass timber right, which is a form of engineered uh, timber. I think the embodied carbon is much lower. And not only that, it has another advantage, which is that mass timber is a carbon sink, not a carbon source. As long as forests are sustainably managed for every tree that is cut and, and ends up in a building, that tree has in its lifetime absorbed carbon from the atmosphere, and that carbon is now stored in a building, right? So as long as a new tree is planted, that's a very positive thing. Now, most people think about, oh, mass timber or, or lumber or wood, it's going to create a fire hazard. So mass timber actually performs quite well under fire. It burns quite slowly because it creates a char, which is a very kind of dense layer of carbon that blocks any oxygen from going through and really kind of slows the, the fire down to the extent that people can safely leave the structure. And I want to shift gears a little bit towards like urban design. And, and I imagine yeah. in, you know, in your seat, you, you have a view on, you know, the, the pandemic has changed a lot, yeah. right? It's changed a yeah. lot of economy. It's changed a lot in our, you know, our, our, our understanding of public health, but I imagine it's changed urban design in some way. And how much of the thinking or your thinking in particular has been influenced by yeah. this pandemic? And, and what have been the effects of it? It's really, I mean, been on top of, I would say, most architects' mind or urban designers for ever since the pandemic. You know, the, the first thing I'd say is that a lot of good things have, have come out of crises. And actually, the discipline of urban planning came from a concern around, you know, cholera and cities and kind of this public health concern. So I, I really see this as a as an opportunity for us to kind of rethink what's happening. So if I just speak about urban design, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword if you're looking at, at New York. So there's a lot of good things that happen. So the pedestrianization uh, of lots of 
uh, streets and kind of the conversion of parking lots around very pedestrian areas into restaurants. On the other hand, however, I mean, car culture is becoming more dominant, right? And if you look at, at the price of, of cars, it's, it's, you know, shut through the roof because people are no longer as comfortable taking the subway. I totally agree. And, and I was, I was actually just, you know, been here in New York this last week and so I've been walking around. It's like re-injected a, a, a vibrant mm -hmm to the streetscape that, you know, mm -hmm. had been stripped of. The other thing that's interesting is, as I was thinking about it, economics are actually fundamentally a play because, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that the real estate industry had been coping with prior to COVID is that retail rents no longer made sense, right? As retail sales declined, rents didn't make sense. But what we really did is just massively increase the denominator. So the rent mm -hmm. stays the same for pretty mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. any restaurant that's out there. Mm -hmm. But the square footage probably went up by a third to half, mm -hmm. to like 30%. Yeah. And yeah. as it does, your effective rent drops yeah. by a third to 50%. Yeah. So what's, yeah. what's kind of interesting is like, it's almost like this natural reset where we just got to create a whole yeah. lot more commercial space. Yeah. And in so doing the yeah. economics that might have been underwater suddenly became yeah. viable again. I love how you think about that because, you know, parking, uh, like let's say it's a street surface parking lots, right? It probably, they can probably charge $4 an hour, right? But if you have in that same space, let's say two tables, your profit will probably be a much higher than that, right? And, and if you're looking at Even if you looked at it because the city, right, is getting those, mm -hmm. those parking fees, the restaurant is getting, you know, the, those, those covers from the restaurant. But I, I think yeah. even if you probably looked at it on a sales tax basis mm -hmm. and you were like the the aggregate sales taxes that come from reconstituting and repurposing that space from a yeah. restaurant for a 2,000 yeah. pound hunk of metal versus people eating things and, you know, high yeah. market meals, that's totally different use case. And it's like the yeah. COVID kind of gave us an opportunity to reimagine that. You're absolutely right. You know, a couple of years ago, I gave a TED talk on how to reimagine parking lots because of self-driving vehicles. Because, you know, the idea is when, when self-driving cars are there that, you know, most of us will be sharing cars. And so we don't really need as much parking anymore, right? Which is a huge opportunity. <laughs> but obviously the self-driving car, it just keeps getting delayed. But it's, it's funny that now a crisis, a pandemic has really uh, led to this shift in which right. we can kind of reuse parking. Uh, so again, yeah, it's 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 looking at the bright side of this uh, kind of terrible thing that happened. But yeah, it's it's like a big reset, like you mentioned. And so you've obviously looked very closely at kind of how autonomous vehicles and the advent of, and I imagine you're talking about mass commercialization of autonomous yeah, vehicles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're being yeah. a ubiquitous thing. But once they are, posit that they are. How yeah. do you think that changes the streetscape of a city like New York? Yeah, no, I, I'm really very excited about that. I mean, if you look at the history of uh, cars in cities. So about you know 100 years ago, the mass production of the T Ford really made it affordable for people to have cars. And little by little, our streets changed. Right before we had streets, everything happened on the streets. It, it wasn't just somewhere to to go from A to B. It was actually more kind of a place to be. The car changed that. I think we can turn back the clock a little bit with self-driving cars. And the reason is that they're much safer to pedestrians uh, because they're not subject to human error. Now, now obviously. <laughs> They're not safe, quite safe yet, right? But if you're looking at how unsafe uh, real drivers are, I mean, per year, there's more than a million people that die as a result of traffic collisions, right? It, it is a, a massive killer. Uh, so once with self-driving uh, vehicles, you know, that safety will go up. Mm -hmm. I think about yeah. a self-driving car as being somewhat synonymous yeah. or, or coincident with people not owning cars, right? A decline yeah. in their ownership. What is the amount of space? If you looked on the island of Manhattan, that yeah. is used for the storage of idle vehicles. If you're to strip that, yeah. the cars don't need to be idle. They can be perpetually operating. That reclaims an enormous portion of yeah. usable real estate or usable green space or usable yeah. just space, yeah. right, in, in, in an economy. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. So I've actually calculated that number for New York oh. City uh, based on public records. Uh, and this is not including the street parking. So it's only the off-street parking lots. Uh, and it's about 15 times Central Park. It's so 15 if you, Central Park. So 15 park. Central Park. Uh, and if you would calculate that in the number of, you know, uh, housing units you could build, it's about 4 million. So wow. it's, it's, it's crazy, right? Uh, and that's New York City, which is a metro city. If you look at LA, for instance, so LA County has about the size of four San Francisco's. 
that's just parking. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. So that's a huge opportunity. Yeah. And I imagine also it's, it's like within, when you look within some of those spaces, a lot of it's also dead space as well. And I imagine that's true of major arteries, meaning mm -hmm. a large portion of where the kind of automobile infrastructure probably goes is space that really isn't useful in terms of moving you or transporting you, you know, giving yeah. you care from one place to another. All yeah. that is space consumptive as well. Yeah, you're right. And there's actually one more thing to think about, which is not not very positive, but there is a, a danger in self-driving vehicles is that because they make it more convenient to travel, right? So the threshold of taking a self-driving car when you don't need to drive it, costs go down because there's no driver involved. Um, you know, it, it may be for more people uh, more available. What that could mean is that cities could sprawl more outward. Right. You could live a little further if you can, you know, just work in the car or do some other things. You're not driving. Uh, so, so there is this kind of risk inherent in them. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. I, I, I really enjoyed this conversation about, you know, both mm -hmm. sustainable building design, but also urban design and urban policy and some of the, the dynamics mm -hmm. around autonomous vehicles and what they ultimately will mean for cities. It was just fascinating. So thanks for taking the time to share it with me. Uh, thank you, Brendan. Really appreciate it and enjoyed our conversation. And I hope, you, hope to meet you in New York City one day. Absolutely. Thank you.